six items if you count public comment at the end. Um, approval of minutes for the April 24 meeting, the Holt Private Road Review, mm. Maxwell Wood Subdivision preliminary approval is on the agenda, and in other business, 19 Wells Road Tower Overlay District Amendment, and a public hearing on 27 Fowler Road uh, BB District Zoning Amendment. So we'll begin with approval of the minutes from the April 24 meeting. Any changes, any additions, omissions, any motion? Um, make a motion to accept the minutes from last month. This is awesome. <laughs> this, is, this is great. <laughs> Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? If it's unanimous. Motion on these monitors. All right. Next item is the whole private road review. Dr. William Polk is requesting a private road review to upgrade his existing driveway to provide frontage for a new lot to be created at the end of Running Tide Road, section 19-7-9, public hearing. Bob, you want to take it away with a we're overview of everything? We got, we got speakers here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair Jordan. I'm Bob McCaff, the Metro and Associate, uh, representing Dr. Holt, who's with me this evening. Uh, you've seen this application a, a few times, uh, and if you just want me to just walk through some of the highlights rather than doing a full presentation, I can do it that way. <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, the plans that you have in front of you, we kind of separated and pulled it apart. Well, it's only a 350-foot wide road. There were so many things going on there. I think it just became a little difficult for everybody to, to fully see what was going on, so we did revise that in a set of plans that you had and figured out what that line weight issue was so you could actually see the contours on that lot. So uh, one of the uh, changes with Boop. Okay. I'll step back a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the changes we added to the existing conditions plan was the uh, adding on the uh, high water line based on the astronomical high tide plus three feet for the town. Uh, and we have that on there in addition to the FEMA flood elevation that we had shown on there previously. Uh, we've revised the, uh, the stream setback line on there and put that on the plan. And uh, the other item on here was in regards to the um, NRPA permit by rule. Uh, we did meet with Audie Arbo from DEP. Uh, went over the plans, and while she wasn't 100% sure we needed to really file an application for PBR, she decided conservatively to request us just to submit one, so we did. Uh, that's been submitted. I don't know whether the Maureen has heard anything back there. We're going to email the application approval to you. It may not have. We submitted it on the 10th, and she wasn't sure exactly how quickly she would get it turned around and back out the door. Where it's a PBR, it's basically a 14-day time frame for the turnaround on that. Uh, the issue in terms of you're just electrifying. In regards in regards to the vernal pool, we had Albert Frick's office go out, and there was a uh, an email we received on the 19th that we forwarded back to the board. Uh, they did go out and assess what the conditions of that vernal pool, and that it did not meet the criteria to support vernal pool habitat. Uh, in addition to that, it was just the re-verification of the RP2 delineation for that wetland that was done earlier on uh, when there was a frozen conditions, and the line is confirmed with the same excuse me, delineation as we've shown on the plan. So there was no change to that. Uh, there was a question I know on the site walk, and I know Mr. McNamee had submitted a letter to the board today, or a letter I received a copy of today, in regards to how we broke the line between the RP1 and the RP2 wetland. Uh, Albert Frick had submitted a response to this, Mr. McNamee's first letter, to which you folks have and had prior to the site walk, and basically that determination is based on the town zoning provisions where the 100 foot by 100 foot rule where you have a wetland that necks down to less than 100 feet in width and for a lot greater than 100 feet in length, that the determination can be broken out that it would be classified as an RP2. Uh, and I understand I received 
just before I came here, I was going through my email. I understand you received something from Ben McDougal in response to the same uh, question regarding that. So I just wanted to, to bring that to the forefront. The other things that we have done to the plans is in regards to the proposed lot, uh, the issue in terms of clearing limit around the 250-foot uh, uh, RP1 setback line, which is the back portion of the building window. Uh, we've added on there a note including some designation to have some large boulders put along that perimeter line just to help delineate where the limit of clearing would be uh, for the, uh, the building window. In addition, because of the grading questions and drainage questions on that lot, we've added an additional note on 9 on page L3 uh, that basically says prior to the issuance of a permit, building permit, a grading plan for the house lot needs to be submitted to the Code Enforcement Office for review. Uh, and basically that we're talking about all the drainage to be pitched towards the uh, vineyard lane. And those are the changes we've made in terms of uh, updated information. I can go through my response letter that you have uh, that I responded to Maureen's comments as well as uh, Steve Harding's comment. Uh, I take there is one other note we did add on there, and that was in regards to the language for a note concerning if the adjacent Duffett property were developed. Uh, is a note that we had provided to Maureen reviewed, and it was added that to the plan discussing the future access way if that lot were acquired by the same entity and redeveloped and had improvements over $10,000 in excess of $10,000. And the other note, I'm going to go back to lot two because I missed that one, is in regards to clearing activity within the 250-foot uh, setback area, basically the wooded area on the back portion of lot two. We've added a note on there that basically is for the removal of dead and hazardous trees, and that's also subject to the uh, Code Enforcement Officer review before that activity can occur. And I won't read the entire note, which is rather lengthy, but in short, it's just to remove the tree. There is no disturbance allowed, no lawn activity uh, to be created in those areas. So. And if you want me to go through the review, the responses to the review, or... Okay. You're welcome. Come to the podium, your name and your address, and you have three minutes. Um, Maureen will be timing, and uh, just do you, please try to keep within those three minutes. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this particular project? Affording me the opportunity to address you. I grew up in Cape Elizabeth. I was educated here, all the way from Cottage Farm School to exactly this room. I sat, I sat in sixth grade for a year. I spent a great deal of time in Broad Cove when there were no homes there, and was very close with the entire Belfour family and watched that development grow. Where my home is today, we used to ride our bikes and have a lot of fun as children. I bought my home in 1999. I do not, as a layman, all of this as a layman, I have a very hard time grasping the notion that there can be a large body of water, identified obviously as RP1, everything north of it is RP1, everything south of where the RP2 is being determined being RP1. You have a large body of water, an acre downstream, you have RP1. Somehow in between there, it's been designated as RP2 by Mr. Frick, who I, after reading the report, saw that he did not give any soil samples, vegetation samples, anything of the sort. So from my standpoint, we do not have quantifiable determination that property being RP2. And that is 
crux of the matter. That is RP1. I think that it changes everything. Uh, I am asking the board to seriously consider a new independent study done to determine whether or not that area is legally RP2, found by the EPA, found by an agronomist, whoever that may be. I am happy to go and find one, and I'm happy to pay for that because I just find it extremely, extremely hard to understand how you can have a body of water, how you can have a stream flowing all the way through the RP2 into the RP1. <coughs> this acreage right here has somehow been determined by eyesight, the Frick report says, by eyesight, not by a soil sample, not by a vegetation sample, by no real scientific study. So my request Obviously, my dream home, I want to retire there, and I want to die there. I'm a Cape Elizabeth kid. And all I'm asking the board to do is, before we go any further, if we could possibly entertain what I think is the fair and just thing to do, is to have an independent survey done once and for all. It will be near-term, medium-term, and long-term good effect for everyone to know concretely whether or not that is RP1 or 2. And I don't believe it's RP2. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to speak? Thomas McNabo, uh, Cumberland, on behalf of the Flaherty's. Um, <clears throat> this is obviously all about uh, field verification. And I don't want to repeat anything I said in my letters to take a look at. But uh, field verification is, is a term of art. Uh, it's actually defined in the ordinance. And if you look at the ordinance <clears throat> on Section 19.25, uh, field verification would seem to mean that the surveyor uh, produce a topographic map, which I don't believe has been done. Uh, he should have produced a high-intensity soils map uh, showing the wetland up, upland edge for the site to find, which I don't believe has been done. He should have a description of the vegetative cover of the site, including dominant species, etc., not been done, and a description supported by the necessary documentation explaining why the site is not an RP1. <clears throat> I understand the board has alternatives uh, to deal with this problem, but this uh, was deemed to be complete on the 24th. And now we're here again now with possibly new evidence that I haven't seen. I would like to see that before you make a determination, have an opportunity to respond to but my the 100 by 100 rule without a survey identifies the exact parameters of this uh, wetland area is a very, very close call. It's right on the line. And if you had a surveyor or somebody down there identifying plant life and the hydric soils and so forth, enlarge this area, possibly significantly, maybe diminish it, but change all of it. You also have a driveway involved private road involved, uh, which uh, even if it is uh, an RP1 wetland, uh, you can't, as I understand the ordinance, you can't get a resource permit for a private So, again, I'd like the opportunity to look at this, uh, have another set of eyes look at this, and I'd like an opportunity before in a final decision look at any new materials that have been submitted after the date just to sound to be complete. Have a week or two to re Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this particular project? Seeing no one, I declare the public hearing closed. Uh, 
Bob, you have any response to? I don't have Al Frick with me, but I've worked with Al for better than 30 years. I know this board has experienced <laughs> Al's work. And uh, I had Al respond to Mr. McNabow's first letter, of which he did respond to. And I understand he didn't feel as though that was exactly clear enough for what he was looking for. I know Al has gone out. He's done the evaluation for this property, including the rest of the property that was you know, divided off earlier in the previous re reviews by this board. So I have no question of Al's credibility in terms of how he came up with delineation and did field work uh, to arrive at the determination for the difference between the RP1 and the RP2. Does anyone on the board have any questions of, of Bob before we proceed? Go ahead. Would it be possible to have Mr. Frick address um, council's observations? <coughs> you said he's here tonight? He's not here tonight. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said he was here. No, if he was here tonight. <laughs> should have left the magnet at home. Uh, if you were here tonight, I would have Al stand up to respond. I did try to reach out to him earlier today, but he was out in the field, so I was able to hook up with him again. Could, could you just could you explain to me the hundred foot rule? The way it's described to me, and the way it's written in your ordinance, it, if the wetland narrows down so that's less than a hundred feet wide. And that's consistent, less than 100 feet wide, greater than 100 feet long. It constitutes a break. And I know with the straight line question that came up, how can it be a straight line? Because usually wetland changes will be defined by either panels or irregular edges. And Al covered that in his letter. That really what it does, it falls down in between. You can have one different type of wetland running into another, you know, in terms of they would have different criteria different values, and again, I'm crossing out of my expertise and crossing someone over to Al's. But that's basically how that 100 by 100 foot rule worked. And I believe that was probably extracted from a DEP rule that was in place probably about uh, 20 years ago anyway. And that's the way DEP had determined their class. Victoria, did you have something? I, um, now, when the southern lake portion, that RP1, RP2 that we're right. talking about, when that was originally um, surveyed by uh, Alfred Associates, mm -hmm. it was from December 11th, 2014. Did, do you have in your possession the documentation that would show the soils, the plants, the, the full report that uh, we do receive typically from Mr. I do not have that with me right now. I'd have to go back and look at the files because a lot of that work was originally done. We were assessing the entire parcel itself. So you do believe back in your files? I will have to go back and look at it because honestly, I wasn't working on this when this project first started. So without me going back to look through the files and everything, I can't give you a definitive yes. Uh, but I'll get you an answer. Okay. Um, because, I mean, when I was reading that letter, um, from the attorney, it said uh, none of the field verification was performed by Al Frick using the Army Corps of Engineers manual. Um, but Al, that's the methodology he does that use. That is the methodology Al uses. And to be perfectly honest with you, there are times in which we have wetland delineation done. But we do not have full reports done, but that's how it is based on. And Al would not hang his hat on a wetland delineation without having used the Army Corps criteria. And I also, in that same letter from the attorney, it said there was a note on the plan that the ground was frozen and the area should be reevaluated in the spring of 2017. And that reference note was to the Vernal Pool exactly. area. And yeah. the wetland was, they had the issue with the frozen condition was to determine whether it was a Vernal Pool. Yes, that's that correct. Was, if you look at the note on the plan, there's an arrow. And the arrow is not to... The southerly wetlands. Right. It's to another wetland yes. in question. Um, also, um, there was a discussion in that letter that the field determination was preliminary, which when you read the letter from the attorney, I took it to mean a uh, field test wasn't done, it wasn't conducted because of the adverse weather conditions, the frozen ground, the snow. But once again, the one we're discussing was done on December 11th, 2014, and at that time, the conditions were not the same 
right. as this one. And um, But if you go back to Al's letter in regards to why this was just preliminary, um, I can quote the, from Mr. Frick. He said, the RP1 zoning setback appeared to be the most controlling factor with regards to development potential of your parcel. And John Mitchell wanted me to do a phased wetland delineation pro approach to your project for cost effectiveness. Should your parcel be significantly limited to development potential for the RP1 rating, then he wouldn't continue on. So I'm taking that to mean when um, the attorney is saying this was preliminary, it was phased, the big picture was the preliminary and phase because the most important factor was can this be a buildable lot? Right. What is down there on the southern portion? Right. And Mr. Frick Field verified that December 11, 2014, RP1, RP2, and he wrote a letter saying there's a giant map hanging up in you know, in the town hall, mm -hmm. and it says five. And I would now throw it back to the town planner to say how accurate are our maps compared to what we want, and we put in the ordinance, getting a soil scientist mm -hmm. feet on the ground and delineating. So, um, Maury, I'm going to ask you, how accurate are our maps compared to Mr. Frick's And I'm going to take just a moment so I quote it to the ordinance, but... The practice is that the maps we have are better than, but the the townwide zoning map is the best information we have at a townwide scale. It's based on soils mapping that was conducted using aerial photography, so it doesn't even pick up wetlands that are less than two and a half acres. So it's better than having no wetland information at all. But when you're making a determination of wetland boundaries on a specific property, we require field verification. And the field verification note is on the zoning ordinance, the zoning map, and I will quote from the ordinance. This is the RP district section 19-69. The town has prepared a zoning map showing the RP1 CW district based upon the best available information at a townwide scale. The actual boundaries of this district, however, shall be determined by field verification in accordance with Section 1925, Location Resource Protection District Bound. So it's not unusual for the, in the boundary lines of a wetland to be a little different from the zoning map because it's like peeling an onion. And the zoning map is that outermost layer. And if, when you go to a specific property, we direct property owners not use the zoning map, but take, make the investment in having a professional walk their property and bring a soil map to the town based on the definitions in the zoning ordinance. So the zoning ordinance, where we don't have flexibility, is where the zoning ordinance defines what is an RP1 and an RP2. And it says RP1 is very poorly drained soils, it's obligate wetland vegetation, and you have to have at least one acre. And then there is also this 100 by 100 rule. And, you know, you can argue that maybe this rule is too lax in wetland protection, or you could argue that the current Cape Elizabeth wetland regulations are too restrictive because of the 250 foot buffer. And that argument's been happening for as long as I have worked in the town. But the concept is that a lot of times wetlands have fingers. And how far to the 250-foot buffer extend beyond the finger. And the decision was made to use an approach similar to what the DEP used at the time, whereas once a finger gets less than 100 feet wide, you go another 100 feet and you top it off. And that's the end of the RP1. And anything remaining that is wetland soils, either poorly drained or very poorly drained, automatically gets classified as RP2. So this is a rule that we've used before. It's been applied before. The point to other developments in town have been used. And you know, there could be disagreement on whether it's appropriate, but this is what's been used. And there is also a letter, excuse me, an email from the code enforcement officer who has reviewed these plans, has reviewed all of the letters from Al Frick, has looked at the ordinance, and he's made the determination that he finds this interpretation be satisfied.
that answer your question? That does answer mine. And um, <coughs> we have a ruling now from our code enforcement officer. I don't know because um, from past experience, um, if we don't make decisions based on our knowledge, it may not hold up in court. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to get into that. But would it be uh, too far to say uh, we could actually put a motion saying before we go forward that that data is produced? Or does the code enforcement officer already have these, these similar 2014 reports in his office? He, every single thing that has been submitted by the applicant automatically goes to the code enforcement office. So he has, and I, I happen to know for a fact that he reviewed it because we talked about it and we stood over the same plan. Um, he's seen all the communications from Alfred. He's looked at the plans and we measured, we used our, our scale and measured the, the 100 by 100. And it was his determination that what's on the plans is consistent. I can read his words if we need to do that. But he sent an email, which I think was forwarded to the board, which said, I'm, I'm good with this. Okay. I just wasn't sure how far we should take it because of the well, past cases where... I guess the planning board needs to decide whether you're satisfied with that. Because mm -hmm. the ordinance does lay out a process that if the code enforcement officer... He is responsible for making the decision on all zoning numbers. He said this is appropriate. If people don't agree with this interpretation, the next step is to appeal his decision. Okay. Because this is a wetland boundary, the appeal actually goes to the planning board, I believe, with advice from the conservation committee. So typically appeals of the zoning board, so of the code officer, go to the zoning board. But because it's a wetland determination, and I can confirm that, but I believe if you, if there was anyone who wanted to appeal that boundary determination, I think it goes to the planning board. Okay, I'm just trying to really, you know, dig down, we have the question, I want to make sure that this board does give it, address it, look really deeply into it. Um, we've heard from our town planner, we're hearing from the code enforcement officer, um, Everyone else on this board will have the opportunity to weigh in on their opinion, too. But I want to make sure we are thoroughly looking into this. Um, I'm all set on this particular question. I have other questions on regarding the plan. But if anyone else wants to discuss the wetlands and anything around it. <laughs> so under Section 19-2-5, if an applicant, and this is what it's if an applicant disputes the determination of wetlands, the boundaries of resource protection district or buffer district by the code enforcement officer, or if the code enforcement officer concludes that the location of the boundary is in doubt, the applicant shall submit the following information to the planning board unless weighed by the planning board. Site plan, topographic map, high intensity soil survey, description of the vegetative cover, description of uh, why the site is or is not in our district, and additional information. Um, the code officer, the planner, the planning board may request the conservation commission to inspect the site. Uh, the code officer may consult expert persons or agencies. And the code officer, the planning board, uh, may exclude areas beyond the point where the wetland area is less than 100 feet in width for a distance of more than 100 feet. This has also been tested in court. We actually took this whole process uh, through a court case and the town. Any other questions on this particular topic before uh, Victoria asks her other questions? Just want to round it out. And <laughs> Well, say we've got a I may want to here. come back to it, and I got to. I've gonna, been thinking. About thinking on. It. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, Victoria. Yeah. Okay, um, this is for you. Um, some of the things that I was looking at. Um, let's see. Oh, you just mentioned it, and I couldn't find it. So, could you please help me locate? Because I was going to ask you to put a note to the plan, but you say it's already there. I need a second set of eyes requiring a grading plan be provided to the code enforcement officer for review to ensure the runoff from lot two. If you look at plan sheet, I'm going to step back and that up again. Plan sheet, I think it's three, note nine. L 
L3. Once again, um, there's still, um, this was from uh, the town engineer, that a note be added to the plan requiring the contractor to be certified in erosion and sediment control by the DEP to work on this project. Is that, I did not find that. It should be on the erosion control plan, but I don't have a full set of plans, and if it's not, I'll make sure it's on there, because it wasn't marked up for them to put it on that plan. Okay. okay. We did hear from our fire chief, and he reviewed a note, it's number 11 on sheet L2, mm -hmm. and when he reviewed it, he did ask for one word change, and I didn't see that the word got changed, so I would say that the word protection be changed to suppression on note number 11 on sheet L2. It wasn't changed? Again, you can help. Yeah. No, number 11 on L2, he wanted the word protection. Yeah, I know, I remember that. To be changed to suppression. Yeah. I will double check it. I will double check it, but I was pretty sure that I had asked that to be changed, so I'm aware okay. of that. But you recall the letter from the fire chief, yeah. And then um, I know you're pending that the NRPA permit by rule review is submitted to the town planner and any recommendations are completed prior to the issuance of any permit, something along those lines. So you've acknowledged that you're pending this, and I also... Yes, it's a 14-day notification process, and uh, Audie said that she would email the a letter with the application mm -hmm. back to Maureen so that she would have it for her file. Okay, so if we do make a ruling tonight, I guess those might be conditions, mm -hmm. conditions of approval, yeah. and you're fine with all those? Because oh, yes. um, that's what I was questioning, so... That would be it for questions that I have in regards to this application. Anybody else? Any other questions? Quiet. How about, how are your thoughts, Jelling Jim? For you to well, I, I guess I'm a, I, I share Victoria's, I guess I'm somewhat uncomfortable with doing, uh, just looking at the map and not actually doing a dig, but I guess I've never had, uh, it, have we had to do this 100 by 100 foot four? Yeah. <laughs> you want to camp? Yeah. So uh, there's a project that's just north of Thin Road? Uh, on a trunk road called okay. the Hemlock Hill Sub. Okay. And there is, it's, it's Oakhurst Road, I'm excuse me. And if you drive down Oakhurst Road close to the Mitchell Road end, you mm. know where it gets very low, two or three plant. Mm. And there's actually a wetland that goes on both sides of that trunk. Okay. And the Hemlock Hill subdivision was allowed to be constructed because the developer was able to show that that wetland met the 100 by 100 rule. And after 100 feet, they cut it off and the rest of it is our two so that no wetland alteration was done, but you it, the lack of the 250 foot buffer extending further was uh, made possible. That so that was several years ago. I'm not aware of any additional flooding. No. Okay. All right, I guess it's a new one for, for me. So, go ahead, Peter. Be... Yeah. <clears throat> Question for Bob. The, um, I guess. Maybe nagging some of us is that there are these three reports, uh, 2014, April 2017, and fairly recently. And the, the wording, it gets a little bit mushy among the various reports, and I think the council letter referred to it as uh, being a, a reconnaissance type of survey and, and preliminary and whatnot. Is there a point in Mr. Frick's work where there is a definitive determination made that, yep, this is RP1 and this is RP2, and I, I, I'm not finding that, that focal moment. I understand, and I guess, again, I can't speak for Al, but when we hired Al to do this, it was to determine what the abilities were for this property. And we had to look at the entire original total acreage. Uh, 
in order to determine whether or not something could be done on that. And so he did field work to do it. It wasn't a case where he looked at the town's map and he just didn't walk along the site and say, yeah, that's where it is. He actually went out and did his evaluation. And when Al does preliminary evaluations, and it's the same thing when he does for site suitability for septic location, they'll go out and they do test pit. They do augers, shovel pit, uh, and they look at the vegetation so that they get an idea in terms of what the soil horizon profile is, whether it meets the hydric soil, the soils themselves fall into the hydric classification as well as the vegetation. So he does do more than just say this is an RP1, this is an RP2. So there is field work that's done. When he says preliminary, there are times if we have to have a full-blown wetland report and study done, he does that. But his initial evaluation are pretty much spot on in terms of when he goes out to do a delineation for it. I mean, otherwise, then we're wasting our clients' money trying to tell them they can do something that he can't do. Anyone else? I'll just like to say from my position is uh, we've, seen, we've reviewed a lot of projects in which Alfred is involved and uh, is his uh, respect in the area in which he, he works is very high. He's very, very, very well respected by other people in the field. And uh, I think it's unfortunate we don't have to put our hands on the 2014 report, which I think would make a lot, a lot of people feel better. But I also have a high regard for our code enforcement officer. And if he's done this review, this is his job. I. I personally support his his call. Anybody else? Go ahead. Peter. Yeah, I, I think I find myself leaning your way, Carolyn. The um, identifying with a you know precision the the boundaries of wetlands or the types of wetlands is <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it's a little bit of you know science and art uh, combined, I think, and the fact that we do have a, a trusted. Um, professional, as well as our code enforcement officer, uh, acknowledging that people may differ on exactly where you might draw the RP1 and 2 boundaries. Uh, I think based on our uh, practice, that this, this will be an acceptable decision to take their, take their word as it presented. Go ahead, Victoria. Um, I was just thinking that if there was another person here who used to be here last year, she would have said, where is it? I want this in front of me. And I, so I'd like to just ask the board, um, I feel very confident in Alfred's work. I am confident in our code enforcement officer's work. I don't wish to question either one of them, but I will put it out there. We do not have the December 11th, 2014 document that I know was completed. A field verification would not be done without all the work that I've seen Al do. He would not just walk out there and just say, yeah, looks good. He's taking the soil samples. He's doing, looking at the vegetation. He's writing it up. I've seen those reports. They're so dull. They're this thick. He does his work. Don't enjoy his brief. And so I don't know. I like This is what I like to throw out to the board. <clears throat> an actual uh, condition of approval saying that that Al will produce his December 11th, 2014 report prior to any work commence. So I'm just going to throw that out as a condition of approval. If that would satisfy a question coming from neighbors, and I'm sure the work was done, so I, this is something he'll just have to say, let me go to my files. Do <coughs> say and then we can also say that we do have evidence up and it will be presented to the town because it'll be a condition of approval. So that's what I'm throwing out to the board for their consideration. It's fine with me. Seeing no response, I'm assuming yes. Yeah. So. No, just one question. Do you propose, and if that's the condition, that the Whatever Al produces will get substantive review by the board or by the town planner. I mean, at some point, a stack of paper, is, who's going to look at it and decide that, that the condition is satisfied? Go ahead. I mean, 
you could draft the condition that the, that the field report be provided that support the mapping that's already on the thing. And that way, of the code enforcement officer? Yeah, yes. yeah. And if, and if they, mm -hmm. some, they don't have field report, then they would have a condition they can't meet, and it would get kicked back to the planning board. Right. Yeah. That's right. We still, uh, we don't have to. That's right. I'd like to suggest that the code enforcement officer make the determination of satisfactoriness of the report. In the condition of yep. approval? <clears throat> That's on the board. I take it you, you don't have, I mean, you know that report's out there. So it's not going to hold this up. Yeah. And I, if it, I don't have it with the files with me right now. So I just, uh, yes, and yeah. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Caroline. I'm trying to. I'm trying to write. <laughs> trying to get some notes done. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to be in the minority here, but I'm not sure I really agree with this. Um, you know, I think that Albert Frick, as a professional, has provided us with his conclusion in the form of what's in front of us, and I don't know that it's necessary to have his all the material that led him to this conclusion. I mean, he's tested in the letter he just wrote and in this document that this is the proper setback. So I'm not really sure what providing that letter is going to do for it. So, so your position is that we don't, I don't, think it's we don't necessary. need such a condition of approval? Yeah. Go ahead, Jonathan. I, I, I echo... Go on that. I don't think it's necessary, but I don't mind seeing it, because especially if we have a neighbor who is concerned about it. Um, but what I, when I make my findings, it's going to be based upon um, what Alfred provided us, what the app provided us, uh, what the code enforcement officers told us, but also what we saw on the site walk. And what I saw on the site walk, uh, not that I'm an expert in any, uh, any stretch, but what I saw on the site walk, to me, um, you could see sort of the delineation that we saw on the map and what we saw at the location. I remember we spent a lot of time looking at that piece of uh, the property border between the Bagan property and the proposed lot, and um, that had standing water on it at the time, but the land that we walked up that was the building envelope that we actually had the applicant specifically map out for us um, appeared to me to not be a, a, a wet, not to fall into that RP2 category. So that would be what I'd be making. Anything else? Okay. Um, anybody ready for a motion? We do have a, the, the PBR is also a condition of approval. Yeah, do you want? I mean, I can make friendly motions at the end. Okay. Do you have something written out nicely? I, I did try to write okay. some things out. So <laughs> if that, I'll run them by Joe for friendly amendments at the okay. end. Okay. All right. Motion for the board to consider. Finding of fact. One, Dr. William Holt is requesting review of an upgrade of his existing driveway at 15 Running Tide Road to a private road, Vineyard Lane, in order to provide frontage for a new lot which requires review for compliance with Section 19-7-9B, New Private Road. Two, the private road will not result in undue water pollution. The private road is not located in the 100-year floodplain. Soils will support the proposed uses. The slope of the land, proximity to streams, and state and local water sources, uh, resources, rules and regulations will not be compromised by the private road. The private road will have public water infrastructure to provide sufficient quantity and quality of potable water for Lot 2. The private road will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion control plan provided. The private road will not cause unreasonable road congestion or unsafe vehicular and pedestrian traffic. The private road extends an existing road network and therefore supports connectivity while discouraging through traffic. The private road is laid out to conform to existing topography as much as feasible. 
All lots are provided with vehicular access. The private road is designed to meet town standards with exceptions of waiver, with exception of waivers granted for road width and centering in the road right of way. Six, the new lot two will have adequate sewage disposal. Seven, the private road will have will not have an undue adverse impact on scenic or natural areas, historic sites, significant wildlife habitat, rare natural areas, or public access to the shoreline. Eight, the private road is compatible with applicable provisions of the comprehensive plan and town ordinances. Nine, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. Ten, the private road will not adversely impact surface water quality. 11, the private road will not adversely impact the quality or quantity of groundwater. 12, the private road is not located in the floodplain. 13, the private road is not located in a wetland. 14, the private road will provide for adequate stormwater management. 15, the private road is not located in the watershed of Great Pond. 16, Private road is not located in more than one municipality. 17. The private road is not located on land where liquidation harvesting was conducted. 18. The lot served by the private road will have access to direct sunlight. 19. The new lot 2 served by the private road will include a vegetative buffer as a result of the building envelope and the restrictions on vegetation removal outside the building envelope. 20. The lot served by the private road will be provided with access to utilities. 21. The private road does not include a phasing plan that provides for emergency access during all phases of construction. Is that right? Mm -hmm. okay. 22. The applicant has substantially addressed the private road standard in section 19-7-9. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to address the recommendation in the town engineer's letter dated May 11, 2000, 2017. Two, that the road maintenance agreement be signed and recorded in the Cumberland County of Deeds. Three, that there be no alteration of the site nor issuance of a building permit until the plans have been revised to satisfy the above condition and submitted to the town planner for review. I'd like to make some friendly motions. Conditions of approval. Okay. Um, do you want to? Oh, do we? Let's second, second, second first. Oh, a second first. Sorry. Second. John, John, second. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Um, I would, Before you start. Yep. Uh, therefore, be it ordered based on the application of doctor. Let's say doctor. Yeah, it should, okay. it should say. Or. Where, where's, what is it? Go back to. To old private road before. review. It should. Therefore, be it ordered. It says the application of Dr. Cole for the upgrade okay. of this driveway at 15 minutes high road to a private road in your name in order to provide frontage for a new lot. And then that's be approved. Yeah. All of that from, from number one should be inserted in there, <laughs> which it normally would be. <laughs> number two is a registry of deeds. Cumberland County registry of deeds. Yes. Does so. Joe have to okay that register? The Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. I mean, how does he have to say Is that yes? a friendly amendment? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Very friendly. Then I would also, on this motion, like to add that a that a note be added to the plans requiring the contractor to be certified in erosion and sediment control by the DEP to work on this project. Okay. And John, do you agree? I do. Okay. That, it, that the word protection be changed to suppression on note number 11 on sheet L2. Okay. 
Okay. I'm okay with that. <laughs> that the NRPA permit by rule review is submitted to the town planner and any recommendations are completed and reviewed by the town planner and town engineer. Did I word that properly, Maureen? That's good. Okay. Good. That's now, this is uh, the one that I'm sure if you can all oh, agree on. Okay, that a field report be provided that supports the report by Alfred Associates from December 11, 2014, be submitted to the town planner and the code enforcement officer for final determination. So, is there. Con I mean. I do you disagree? You disagree with that? Yeah, I disagree. He doesn't want to add that condition. How yeah. do you feel, Peter? But if everybody wants, don't okay. Mind. How do you feel, Peter? Do you want to add that condition or no? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm yes or no? Yeah, yeah. One. Okay. No. no. I'm an okay with it. So we got. Will you a yes or no? You're no. Uh, I'll say it. Yes. No. And yes. yes. So. Well, I'll actually, I, because it was brought up by an abutter, I'll say yes. Okay, so we'll include it, if yeah. it's okay with Joe and yeah. Okay. Now, did I get that? Should that be worded? I want to make sure that we've worded it in such a way that that report will be reviewed. I feel comfortable with your okay, sentence. Okay, with, with the made. wording. Okay. I want to make sure that's correct. All right. That, that was it for five minutes. May I, I ask um, your your numbering of the conditions. So you're going to be number three about the contract or the, is that right? Correct. And Correct. Then four is that the word be changed. Five is the one about the NRPA and six about the field report and then seven will be the alteration. Final one. Okay. Yep. I agree with that. Okay. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Six. Unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. as Maxwell Woods Health. LLC is requesting major subdivision review and a resource protection permit for Maxwell Woods, a 38-unit condominium, an eight-apartment unit development located at 112, 114 Spurwink Avenue. Come on. Oh, there. Excuse me. Bob. <laughs> okay, they're gone. Um, and amendments to previously approved Cottage Brook subdivision to adjust grading adjacent to the extension of Astor Lane, section 16-2-4, major subdivision review, section 16-2-5, amendments to previously approved subdivision, section 19-8-3, resource protection permit, and section 19-9, site plan review. And I've asked Maureen to start this off with an overview of preliminary approval and its purpose and why what we're doing. Okay, let me get rid of this stuff. <laughs> okay, so I think um, the chair has asked me to go over this, and I think because there's been some comments about concerns that information is not available yet. So I'm going to go directly to the subdivision ordinance. Appendix B is the list of submission requirements for major subdivisions. And the Maxwell Woods project is a major subdivision because it has more than five lots or units. And it has significant um, municipal facilities that are proposed to be donated to the town at some point in the future. So specifically under the open space is probably what we need to talk about. But the idea is... 
Unlike any other permit that the town reviews, a major subdivision has a two-step review process. Everything else, it's a one-step review process. You submit, you have your public hearing, you have a vote. With a major subdivision, it's basically twice. You submit for preliminary approval, you make a determination of completeness, you hold a public hearing, and then you vote for preliminary approval. Nobody can build anything with a preliminary approval vote. You can't do anything until you get your final approval vote. And the, I think one of the reasons the town has done it this way, and it's been this way for a long time, is that there's a lot of investment in designing a major subdivision, and the town and the applicant can have a meaningful discussion about the concept of how it's designed before there's a huge investment in the final design of roads, et cetera. So specifically for open space, there are there, there is a submission requirement for preliminary approval that says you have to designate on the plan the land to be permanently protected as open space. There has to be a calculation of the open space provided to meet the open space impact fee. Location of easements. You need to indicate whether there's going to be fee interest or easement deeds of open space to be conveyed to the town or otherwise conserved. So at this level, you're really showing it on a plan and you're talking about what your intentions are. Final subdivision review, the open space requirement is the preliminary plan approved by the planning board for open space preservation supplemented by draft written conservation restrictions, easement deeds, survey descriptions, and any other documentation. So if you were to approve the preliminary plan, then the applicant would need to come back as part of the final review and provide you all the easement deed documentations, uh, description of the meets and bounds for the final review. Any questions? Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Owens. Well, I'll let you introduce yourself and then you can Thank start you, rolling. Carol. Uh, good evening. My name is Owens McCullum, a civil engineer with Tobago Technic here tonight on behalf of uh, Wiley Enterprises. Uh, with me in the audience tonight is Joel Fitzpatrick. Again. Okay. Uh, with me is Joel Fitzpatrick from Wiley Enterprises LLC, uh, doing business in this case as Maxwell Woods LLC, who is the applicant. I've also brought along Kylie Mason, who is a landscape architect from our office, and Kylie's going to talk a little bit about the buffering that we've had prior discussions on uh, in a few minutes. Uh, what I'd like to do is sort of take a couple of minutes to go through the uh, new information that we've submitted as part of the pre preliminary plan submittal. As Maureen indicated, this is a two-step process. We're in the first step of the two-step process, which is the preliminary plan review. We actually made the initial preliminary plan submittal on March 6th. Uh, we went to a planning board meeting in March. Uh, we're back a couple months later addressing some of the follow-up questions with the hope of moving forward. Uh, with preliminary plan approval tonight. Uh, Maureen O'Mara has provided um, a very uh, complete um, staff report. Uh, the town's engineer, Steve uh, Bradstreet from Ransom Engineering, has also conducted a review. We responded to his initial comment, and I'm going to go through all of that. Um, so looking forward in this, initial, in this submittal now, uh, we've added some additional notation to the plans, and I'll show you all that in a minute. I'm just going to go through each of the items um, to address uh, specifically the open space, the type of open space town-owned versus uh, agricultural open space, the conservation easement versus what the association is going to maintain and what was going to be maintained lawn and what would be wooded. Those are notes on the plans now. We also prepared a supplemental 3D perspective of the multiplex building. If you remember, there was quite a discussion about uh, originally had kind of a gambrail look to it. We went from that to a traditional colonial, a very substantive revision to it, and I think that was pretty well received at the last board meeting, uh, but we have since enhanced it a bit more. 
the street landscaping plan was revised to be consistent with the tree growth. There were a few tree species indicated that wasn't on the town's list. We've amended that. Another uh, significant change or uh, addition was we prepared a standalone second, actually third amended subdivision plan for Cottage Brook Condominium. If you remember, we're making the connection with Astor Lane to Cottage Brook. That connection requires a revision to the uh, Cottage Brook plan, so we've created a separate standalone plan, which is in the packet uh, of plans we provided. Uh, that plan would be signed by the planning board and recorded in the registry of deeds. It does two things. It shows the grading and the road connection. It also shows that we're eliminating the street light. Uh, there was a discussion about that, that um, the applicant has um, pedestal or, or mounted lights in the front of each yard. So I'll show you a few pictures here. Uh, the addition of additional light is generally Maureen will have to help me. I don't, I think it's that the town has been taking lights out of service instead of adding a lot of light because of the costs involved with those lights. So uh, we see no need to include those. So that's what that one's about. Another pretty substantive change was there was some discussion around the grading on the apartment unit uh, or the multiplex units. Those are the ones that are accessed from Astor Lane as uh, we had originally presented. We actually had it a little bit lower than the road, actually four or five feet lower than the road. We have since brought that up. It does uh, change the grading on the back of the unit a little bit, but when you come up the street, it'll look uh, more of a uniform grade from the road to those apartment buildings, and we would agree that that was a good change. Um, another pretty substantive, there was been a lot of email back and forth over this on vernal pools on the project site. There are no vernal pools on our project site. Um, we had the we had a soil scientist. I heard you talking about Albert Frick, the two soil scientists, or the uh, wetland scientists and the soil scientists we had uh, were with Al Frick for a long time. They decided to go out on their own, uh, but they were trained under Al. Uh, they did all the work out there. They did it during vernal pool seasons. There was no vernal pools on our property. We went as far as having... Uh, Christine Woodruff and Adi Abo, the DEP's biologist, come out and walk the site. There's an email in your submittal package. There are no vernal pools on our property. There is a vernal pool they notice on the adjacent property, but it's not on our property. We're only obligated to look what's on our property. In addition, um, we had the inland fisheries and wildlife folks come out and walk the site. Um, when we submitted our letter uh, for review, uh, they had indicated that they thought there could be some habitat out there for um, uh, the uh, cottontail rabbit. Um, they walked the site, um, found no evidence of habitat, and there's also an email that was submitted for that. So we hope we have we've brought the regulators out, walked them over the site. We hope we've have moved beyond the vernal pools now and the wetlands. Uh, we've added a new buffering plan to the plan set that's between Cottage Brook and the existing condominium. This buffering plan is a combination of boulder and stone walls and pretty substantive landscaping uh, to break up uh, the trail and the visual between the Maxwell Woods and the Cottage Brook condominium project. The town engineer um, prepared a letter dated May 12th, 2017. Uh, there was two pages, um, uh, quite a bit fewer comments than what was originally in it. One was um, uh, a response noting the wetland areas. Previously, note 14 still appears not to be provided. I have to follow up with him because I think there may be some confusion on that. We have noted specifically on the plan, shown the wetlands, and noted in each wetland, whether it's an RP1 or an RP2 wetland. So those wetlands are noted directly on the plan. We have no wetland impact, and we don't have to deduct any wetlands from our net density. RP, we have no wetland impact. RP2 wetlands, which are which in our project site, don't have to be deducted. So I've got to follow up with him and make sure we understand what he's looking for. Uh, 
uh, on that part of it. Um, the next comment was had to do with the trail crossings blocked by the guardrail. Um, I thought we had removed that. Um, it was a good comment. There's one section. Uh, we removed it at the trail head from Astor Lane, but there was still a section of guardrail that actually isn't uh, needed at the trail crossing from between Maxwell Wood, a cottage brook across the road onto the town open space. That will be removed on the final plan submittal. He asked to have a stabilized construction entrance placed on the cottage brook plan. That's a normal erosion control note. It's actually listed as a requirement in erosion control note on the plan sheet, but it's customary to actually show it on uh, the drawings, which we will do. He asked to have the boulders and the boulder sizes labeled on the plans. I will tell you that we'll put a range of size. I mean, the boulders are intended not to be one size, <laughs> but there'll be a number of sizes. The town, I know that, and I've had a discussion uh, with him on this, and I believe he met with Bob Malley, the town's public works director. There's a, when you meet pavement to pavement, new pavement, the system pavement, there's stock cut joint detail and how you make that connection. Uh, we had a detail on the plan and I, Bob has requested that we do it a little bit differently, which is just fine. Um, we can, we'll make that change. Um, town likes to use cast iron panels for the truck made domes. Pretty straightforward, we'll make sure that's on it. The guardrail, which I actually talked to him on, we made revisions to it, uh, but they've also asked to have a slight chamfer at the top, so it's a guardrail with wood post with a wood barrier on the front of it. Top of it on our on our plan so flat they have to have a slight camper and that really helps just with rainfall, water runoff, water is tend to sit on it. Uh, good idea. Um, as for brick connection detail to the Spurwink Road manhole, um, that's a um, technical detail item that we'll add to the plans. And uh, we've stated this a number of times. It's a good idea. We'll memorialize it on the plan that all construction access will be from the Spurwink Road. That was our intent all along uh, for the project. And then he asked to have some sewer extension standards added to the plan. So uh, the comments are very straightforward. Um, and we'll have those addressed, uh, hopefully, as part of the final plan submittal. We've also filed our application with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection for the Site Location of Development Act, which is currently uh, under review. Uh, that's being done uh, simultaneously with the preliminary and final plan submittal. I, you know, it's hard to predict the timing. We're starting to get back some of the normal review comments, which we'll address. What we typically like to do is have all of the DEP substantive comments done and addressed before we come back for final plan approval. Uh, that's pretty customary to do that. So um, that'll probably take over the next six weeks or so. So if we come back for final plan approval, uh, probably won't be until uh, July or August. With that, I'd like to take a few minutes to walk through some of the plans. I hope. Um, this is just an overview of the project. I think this is pretty much the same slide we've showed before. Uh, the project's located in the resident C zoning in the zone. We're going with open space and multiplex zoning. Uh, there'll be 46 total units, 38 uh, multiplex condominiums, and two four-unit multiplex apartment buildings. The allowed density is 49 units on the project. Our parcel size is a little over 18 acres. We have uh, 8.46 acres or 46% uh, open space on the project. 45% is required. So nearly half of the project is being put into open space. And I think it's important that um, the type of market that we're um, pursuing on this is uh, the aging baby boomer population where we're seeing a lot of people move uh, in, in the 55 and older group. Um, out of their single-family homes, kids have grown up, and there's more of a demand for this type of housing. It's exactly what uh, Jill Fitzpatrick did for Eastman Meadows. I've worked with another developer in southern Maine, Casper Zach uh, Land Bank, who's done uh, many projects like this. It's a model 
approach that is needed for housing. And in fact, the town's comprehensive plan and their housing goals identifies it as, as a demographic that needs to be addressed. This is the plan, um, which you've seen a few different times. So, um, Cottage Brook right here, half the lane making the connection through to Spurwink Avenue. These are the two uh, four unit multiplex uh, apartments. And these are the condominium units, which are duplex with, a, with four single plex units. Um, I have an open space later on that I'll show you. This is the Maxwell Farm that's being retained. This is the conservation open space area. The open space around the perimeter was a proposed trail network through it. Connection from Astor Lane over to the trail network in the Spurwink Woods project. We are building sidewalks along Astor Lane, and we are putting street trees every I think it's every 50 feet, Maureen. Is that correct? Was it 40 or 50 feet? It used to be 40, now it's 50. I, I believe it's 50. 50 now. Uh, so every 50 feet along the project. Uh, this section, this extension of Astor Lane, is proposed to become a public uh, road and will be offered to the town. In fact, we will be providing a letter of offer uh, at the end of this month to go in front of the council. Um, it's just a preliminary acceptance. Uh, we are also going to offer this section of open space to the town because it already abuts town open, open space. So the road and this section of open space will be offered to the town. This is Eastman Meadows, just to give you an idea of what the development uh, would typically look like. Very similar density, very similar layout. Uh, road infrastructure, landscaping, lawn areas, and the unit within the development. This is the road going into Eastman Meadows. It's somewhat like Astor Lane coming in, um, only our Esplanade is actually bigger. This is what the single unit uh, will look like. And last time we were here, we brought in some uh, color schemes and showed you what the colors might be. Uh, this is what a uh, duplex unit looks like. These units are all single-story units intended for aging population, uh, ease of accessibility, two-car garage with the ability to park vehicles in the driveway. On the landscaping around the condo units, each unit will have a uh, landscaping area uh, similar to what we did at Eastman Meadows with a combination of trees, flowers, and um, bushes uh, that will create a landscaping area in front of each houses. And then we have a very specific landscape plan that shows a lot of infill landscape. Uh, this is the fourplex apartment unit that Joel is proposing, uh, more of a traditional uh, colonial look with a uh, balcony in the front uh, or a porch on the upper level, an entrance into the building here, uh, landscaping around the front of it. The units here at one point, if you remember, we had access, uh, stairway access off the front of the building. That's all gone. Uh, the access is all internal to the second floor on the back side of the building. Both lower units and upper units have access on the back side of the building where the parking is. And this is what the landscaping will uh, typically look like in front of those units. Uh, open space. So there's been fair amount of discussion around open space. This is a composite open space plan that I've shown before. Uh, the light green is uh, town or town affiliated open space around it uh, with trails connections through it. We are proposing to add to that, that network, providing trail system around our development, connecting back to Astor Lane and then connecting into the um, Berwink Woods project. There's also a trail that runs down between Cottage Brook and Maxwell Woods. 
and I'll show you some a close up uh, of that in a few minutes. So let's talk about open space for a moment. The proposed open space is 8.46 acres or 46%. 45% is required under the multiplex open space zoning for this project. This comes out of the requirements. If you go back to my March 6th letter that I submitted, I went through each and every criteria of the open space and multiplex standard. And I won't think I read most of that last time, so I won't reread it all again. But um, I'm going to touch on a few highlights. And it, this comes from the town's ordinance. Builds upon open existing open town uh, existing town open space that abuts the project site. Pro provides connectivity to the abutting open space and trail network. An existing trail network in there. Maureen has been diligently or working on some other trail connections with Canterbury and with a couple of adjacent properties, trying to build upon that, we're going to add to that. By the open space, it creates an increased recreational opportunities, public trail access. Um, this is for walking, hiking, biking trails. Uh, they don't allow, this isn't for ATVs, it's not for snowmobiles or anything like that. These trails are constructed very minimally and allowed to develop over time with signage. In fact, I was with Maureen and Joel and the other day, and Joel's putting up some other signs on one of his other projects to get those up in place. Some signs go up around this so that people can see and know where they're going along the open space. The open space through the Maxwell Woods project will, and even though it's going to be private open space, restricted private open space, will have a public easement over the trail. So the public will have full access. This project implements priorities of the comprehensive plan for the preservation of open space. The town went to the trouble to put an open space zoning uh, in their ordinance, identified it within the comprehensive plan. We're trying to implement those standards of open. We provide permanent legal protection through deed restrictions, which you'll be seeing um, those association documents, the easements, deed descriptions, all of that is part of the final plan submittal. In fact, I've been back and forth with Joel's um, attorney, uh, Lee Lowry of Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry, who is putting all that together uh, in anticipation of making a final plan submittal. So those all would come in to you. Um, this is, I want to, I think it's important to note that right in section 1972 of the open space zoning, one of the, one of the criteria right out of there, or one of the objectives right in there is to I'll op the open space zoning is to prevent, to permit innovative approaches to housing and environmental protection. So what we are looking to do is through the configuration of the open space, how we're doing the project, meet those open space plans, the innovatives that we can connect and add to the abutting properties and enhance the open which is exactly what is contemplated and proposed. The ordinance also has a priority. So in the, under the open space zoning, it lists uh, a priorities for open space. First one, obviously, is protection of wetlands and sensitive areas. Second one is preservation of agricultural land. The ordinance recognizes the importance of agricultural land and the protection of the farming that can go on in the town. We are proposing to preserve two, a little over two acres of agricultural use on land of the Maxwell Farm. What this does is it allows the Maxwell Farm both to be compensated for the value of their land, puts the land in the open space under as permanent agricultural land, and allows farming to continue. It's really a win-win, and it and it important to uh, the sustainability of the farming. It creates revenue for them, and it also gives them the opportunity to continue farming operations. There was some reference and discussion on MRSA sections 1101-1121. If you're in the town's open space zoning, it makes reference to um, preservation of agricultural open space, 
and it says consistent with the MRSA section. It's really part of the state's tax code on how that works. And it says a tract of land must be used for farming, agriculture, or horticulture activities, but may include woodland and wasteland within the tract. So it covers a pretty broad spectrum of what um, the agricultural land can be. We have some open land or some wooded land in there, but it's all put under agricultural use. Here's another key thing. One of those requirements in there talks about, um, it, it doesn't, it, it talks about, uh, it can be a track land separate, but it talks about being part of a farm that is at least five acres in size. So are the preserved open space and the adjacent Maxwell Farm property combined to be 8.43 8 acres? And if you look town wide, the Maxwells have over 100 acres, I believe, of, of farmland. So uh, what this does is it certainly meets more than five acres, which The landscaping between the projects. This is where I kind of sit down and I let Kylie talk to you a little bit about the landscape. And Kylie's one of our senior land planners and landscape architects and um, done work for L.L. Beans and many multifamily developments um, and spent some time looking at this to develop a landscape plan to create buffering, a sense of place, and a good experience for both people that live there and the people who use the trail. Kylie, you're in the back. Good evening. Um, thank you very much. I'm much faster than Owens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just to give you a quick overview. That's my internet. <laughs> Um, just to give you a quick overview. So that when we first started looking at it, what I did was I looked at all of these individual deck uh, elevations, and then I looked at the proposed elevations of all these patios. And what I did on this slide was I added the assumed elevation of what those were. Um, and while I can't see it with my superpower glasses on, on an average, we have about a five-foot difference, with the decks being about five foot higher uh, than the average patio. So the goal was not necessarily to screen these individuals looking out, but to screen what they might be looking at. So the bulk of the screening happens above the wall here. And what that does is it's a combination of evergreens, ornamental um, deciduous trees, ornamental shrubs, and ornamental grasses. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you a, a, differentiating, a different palette of material, basically, that will go from evergreen to um, the coppery, papery bark of a river birch to the movement of a maiden grass, uh, some foliage cover offered in some nine barks. There's some perennials that are, are massed in there uh, for some interest. And then we did try and take advantage of some of the tree preservation areas. Um, we do have one bed that I'm adding right here, and that's where there starts to become, this, this becomes almost unequal. Um, to the grades here, and I just wanted to give a little bit of extra buffering. So you can almost see how they kind of wave in, they wave around, uh, they hit the highest point right here, and as we move towards the, the trail as it's moving out, um, they start to fade away, and we have a lot of the maiden grass in this area, a large hedge of hemlock right here, uh, and then they're flanked by some ornamental evergreens in this area. Go ahead. So I just want to ask you a few questions. Sure. I've I didn't know if it was. Okay. So the surface of the trail that you're okay. putting in is going to be. Uh, I don't know how to work your slides, Owens. All right. Okay. There. Oh, right. More? Oh, I just lost it. I don't run technology either. <laughs> <laughs> so the surface of the trail? Yeah. Oh, I believe that they have it in a um, compacted dock. Is that correct? Stone dust? The section of the trail would be more formal with uh, uh, either a stone dust or gravel or just that section. So the other question is I noticed that the landscape on the side of the trail you're showing it is green, but what is the surface going to be adjacent to the so it, You'd have a native seed mix there. So I actually tried to highlight that just a little bit. So you might have lawns on the upside where you're going to have your your lawns or your 
kind of residential areas. And then below both walls, if you envision that that is somewhat of a corridor in between the tree staves and the buffering, that should be um, what I would consider kind of a native mix. It'd be a mix of grama grass, red fescue. You could add clover in there if you wanted. You could certainly add some low-lying Are you anticipating flowers. that would be mowed or is that going to be more I think that if you used a low, and I'll have to look and see what we had on there. Did you specify that? If we, use a, if we used a low mow mix, then something like a grama grass or a red fescue would require minimal mowing. Because, yeah, that, I mean, that, that strip is owned by the town. Mm -hmm. I don't think we want to be mowing to the yeah. trail. I, I think that you could be served well even with um, something like a white clover, red fescue, and grama. And, that, and we've used that in parks in South Portland. The next slide, I, I just, I think I talked about this before in the past. Uh, we talked about the, uh, these units that we're proposing, how we've clustered them, are similar in separation between units in the neighboring area in Spurwink Woods. Uh, curved roads, uh, buildings with driveways, houses, but they're all relatively uh, close with each other so that you can accommodate the open space. So I, the purpose of showing this was really to reinforce that we're developing an existent land pattern with preserving open space. Uh, technical review. Um, so traffic, we went through that earlier. Just a reminder, uh, back in March, we made a presentation on the traffic. We hired main traffic resources, Maureen, uh, Maureen. Sorry, Maureen, I, I'm going to call you <laughs> uh, Diane Morabito. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, we hired Maureen to do the traffic study. Uh, Diane Morabito did the traffic study, counted uh, the vehicles up there, did an impact assessment, determined that there uh, were no uh, impact or adverse impact on the roadway system, uh, that it didn't affect the level of service at the intersection of Burwink Road and Route 7. Uh, one thing we are proposing, and I'll be in the last slide here, is that uh, we are proposing some site distance improvements at the intersection. Showed that to everybody when we went on the site walk past winter. And I've already talked about the ransom consulting main DT, uh, the fact that the site law is under review, had all the regulators out on the site. So at the entrance to the project, if you remember, we kind of walked up here at the road, a little bit of a low area in here that will become a stormwater management area. We're going to clear the vegetation back within the right of way or within the property limit of this project. This brown here represents an area of ledge outcropping that will be cut back. What you see down below here in profile, we actually surveyed this section of the road, is per the town's uh, ordinance requirements showed what the eye height is the person at the intersection, what the approach object was. Obviously looking in the north direction, no interference, very good sight line. We are cutting back some of the vegetation, some of the limbs can interfere with that. Looking southerly, there's a hummock of lead. If you look at it in sight, that lead will be removed in that area. Once that's removed, this, this shows what the proposed this finished grade will be, and this is what the line is like. So we will dramatically improve that line of sight. This is the town ordinance required. Uh, again, tonight we're here to answer, try to answer any questions, hopefully move through the preliminary review process and continue with uh, the DEP approvals and return uh, with the final plan approval. So with that, I'll turn it back to the board and try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Before the board gets into discussion, as we do with all projects, we open for public comment. So is there anyone here? If there's anyone here who wishes to speak on this project, please come to the podium, state your name, your address, and uh, try to please keep yourself to three minutes. All right, thank you. 
Hello, I am Becky Fernald, 313 Mitchell Road. Um, and um, first, I just want to thank all of you here, um, town staff and um, developers, for all the hard work placed. Is this working? <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, in, into um, this project and all the um, revisions and developments. I think the, uh, there's been some improvement on the trails. Um, I appreciate that. However, there's still a big question. I know you've heard from a lot of people about this, and we've been talking about this at the various planning boards about the open space. Um, and in fact, at the last planning board meeting in March where this project was discussed, um, I think the uh, planning board all and um, town planner expressed great surprise when they found out that the two-acre parcel of agricultural land that was designated as open space is not going to be owned by the developer but by another party. And that still remains a big question. How can that parcel of land be counted as part of the open space within the residential development? That is what the ordinance clearly states. It's owned by another party. It doesn't make sense that that would be considered part of the required open space of the project. And uh, if it's a conservation easement, <coughs> agricultural or, or otherwise, um, there uh, needs to be the deed um, for you to review. And, and in the subdivision ordinance under preliminary approval, uh, I think it's section 20 under open space, it says that before preliminary approval, you need to see that easement deed. That was my interpretation of it. Maybe <laughs> I didn't read it right, but please look at that section. Um, and I think that when you're talking about an easement, you're talking about permanently protecting a parcel of land, you need to know who owns that land, who is it deeded to. And in the ordinance, it says that easements can be deeded to the town, the uh, condominium association, homeowners association, a third party conservation organization such as a land trust, or to the applicant. And, um, you know, I, it just is really puzzling how this parcel of land that'll still be owned by a private party is counting towards this open space. I just feel that you need to address that issue, have answers to that issue before you can proceed to make a a decision on preliminary approval because that has a very big impact on the design of open space in this development. And so if you don't have that information, you still need it. I'd ask you to table the decision for approval until the next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? I'm going to ask that if anyone else wishes to speak on this, could you please make your way to the area by the windows so we can expedite this process? It's uh, already 8.30. We've got a couple more things to do. So yeah. the go ahead. The parcel of land that we're talking about. Your name, your name and address, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Peter Dixon. I live at 29 Westminster Terrace in Thank Cape Elizabeth. And the part that we're talking about is this area here. It's 2.07 acres. You know, the one we're talking about. It's down here in the bottom. And I sent out a letter the other day. I don't know if you all got it. We did. We all received it. If you sent it to Maureen, Maureen forwarded it to the entire okay. board. Just want to bring it up again if I could. Hmm. There we go. Um, I have a question about regarding the Maxwell Woods in the agricultural uh, area. I heard about the five acres. It's a part of some other five acres, but I thought it was part of the thing that needed to be farmed. Um, the first three photos that I'm going to show you actually are the Jordan Farms um, farming, and then the last three will be the Maxwell Woods um, in order to classify for Masco Woods, this land needs to be to meet the definition of agricultural land, which I don't think it does. So here's here is uh, uh, Jordan Farm. Jordan Farms again, different series, different thing. And then here is this little parcel of land that we're talking about. And if you look at it. And these are three different satellite photos. I don't know when they were taken, but 
probably within the last year or so, maybe. It doesn't look like it terribly well farmed. So is this a farming area or is it not? And who's going to farm it and when will they start farming it? I don't have any ground pictures of it, but it looks pretty scraggly. So is somebody going to take, is, is the town going to farm it? Or Maxwell's, I mean, who's going to keep this thing from just growing up into weeds and trees? So thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? All right, I'm going to close it to public comment. And does anyone on the board have any questions or anything they would like to bring up? Go ahead, John. I was just hoping Maureen could possibly address the issue that was brought up here tonight and that we received numerous issues, uh, excuse me, letters about um, with regards to how it's possible that uh, the, that 2.0 acres um, could basically be heated back to the covered. Okay, so. And, and how it would count towards you, basically. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of questions in there. So. And I honestly, I have five pages here, and I'm trying to figure out how to say this in less than five pages. Um, I'm happy to go in as much detail as you would like, but starting with the 2007 comprehensive plan, there's a very long, not too long, but there's a discussion about preserving farmland. And if you go back in many comprehensive plans, Dave Elizabeth talks about preserving farmland, but we don't until now. We haven't actually, in my opinion any boots on the ground on how to do that. Um, but what we talk about is the big threat to farmland, and this is from page 127 of the current comprehensive plan. The high value of land in Cape Elizabeth coupled with the borderline economic viability of farming combined to create the greatest threat to the continuation of farming and the management of woodlands in Cape Elizabeth. Farmers subsisting on meager incomes are hard-pressed not to sell their land for development. In addition, Cape Elizabeth families that have farmed for generations are finding that the younger generation may no longer want to continue the family business. So we have examples of that happening. Measures to protect farms and woodland. The town, in partnership with the Cape Land Trust and others, has taken action to strike a balance between development that will occur and preservation of farms and woodland. The current zoning ordinance includes provisions for clustering of development and preservation of adjacent woodlands and working farmland. One of the examples we have is TDR. Uh, TDR would allow, for example, a farmer to earn money by selling the right to develop his land while retaining ownership of the land for farming by permanently prohibiting by deed the opportunity to develop the land. Cape Elizabeth TDR provisions identify active farmlands and woodlands as sending areas so that landowners have the opportunity to raise funds. Fish and farm markets, it goes on. Independent of local land use regulation, agricultural easements are a tool that can preserve local farms. I can go on for a while. The point is that the idea of holding an easement that strips the development rights off of farmland while the farmer continues to own the land and farm it is recognized as far back as 2007 in the comprehensive plan. And one of the best examples of that is the purchase by the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust of an easement from the Jordan farm so that the Jordan family still owns that land. They continue to farm it. And the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust holds the easement over that property. So it's not unusual for land to stay in private ownership. Um, there's even a goal in the comprehensive plan that talks about the town shall support the continuation of farming, management of woodland areas by working with farmers and landowners to provide for financial rewards and preservation of significant agricultural and forestry areas. So then we go to the comp the future open space preservation plan. This was a plan that was created in 2012. It was a decision by the council to, quote, to implement the recreation and open space chapter of the 2007 plan. One of the things of the 10 items that this committee was supposed to do is that FOSS shall develop a range of tools and approaches to preserve, protect, and enhance critical parcels. These tools should be expansive and include innovative approaches that have been successfully employed nationwide, including zoning, outright land purchases, elimination of incentives for development in critical parcels, methods by which land can be purchased in public-private partnerships, and any other creative approaches other towns have taken. And then it talks about still protecting private property rights. Came up with an open space definition that includes agriculture as considered open space. Uh, it 
it also had a recommendation that the planning board should recommend ordinance amendments that make preservation of agricultural land a higher open space priority when preserving open space as part of new development. And there's, there's more I can go into. So what the planning board did, which was adopted, I think it was in 2015, was a large package of amendments called the Land Use Act. And that was 55 plus pages. All of it were recommendations from the comprehensive plan. And what one of the things you did, I think one of the most important things you did, was that you looked at our open space zoning provisions, which are the cluster provisions, section 1972, that everybody's quoting. And there was some overhaul there. The preservation, and, and I'm just really summarizing here, but when you did that, you increased the open space requirement from 40 to 45 percent for projects in the RB district and projects that had multifamily use. So if this project had been proposed two years ago, you would be looking at 40 percent open space instead of 45 percent open space. The other thing it did is it clarified the open space preservation priorities to bring into those, those recommendations from thought. So the preservation priorities in order of priority are wetlands and wildlife habitat are one, agriculture is number two, greenbelt and recreation are number three, and scenic is number four. So agriculture went from being in the group to second place. Um, I want to point out that none of these categories in your ordinance have a minimum size. What you do instead of requiring that greenbelt has to be at least an acre or agriculture has to be at least five acres, is there is a substantive evaluation by the planning. You decide whether the open space proposal by the applicant meets these criteria. So it's, it's a more substantial requirement than just a numerical requirement. And then the last piece, and again, I am summarizing here, is there is an explicit requirement for permanent preservation. There's a requirement for, quote, legal preservation. And in particular, the documentation shall specify the ownership structure of the open space. Land within a residential development, for example, can be preserved as open space and an easement may be dedicated or deeded to the town of Cape Elizabeth. The land may be deeded to, to a residential development homeowners association. The land may be deeded to a third-party conservation easement or the land may be retained by the applicant. The documentation shall specify at a minimum restricted activities and vegetation preservation. Access to open space must be available to the homeowners of the residential development and is strongly encouraged to be made available to the public. And such access may be limited consistent with the open space priorities. So that's the legal protection paragraph. Then you have the restricted activities paragraph. It says activities on the open space shall be restricted to preserve the open space for future development. No principal residential, commercial, or other building shall be constructed on the preserved open space. Structures related to the preservation priorities may be allowed. For example, open space preserved as wetlands, for example, the wetlands environmental sensitive areas preservation priority. You can include on those properties, even though they're preserved, viewing platforms, nature observation shelters, boardwalk or bridge structures. We've done this many, many times. If you're preserving property for agriculture, you might include a barn or a shed structure. And if you look at the existing easements that are already out there, for example, the Dyer Hutchinson property is owned by a private property owner. There's an easement that sits on top of it that is held by the land trust, and they allow the construction of agriculture-related structures on that conservation property. And if you're having Greenbelt or recreation area, you may include a boardwalk or a bridge structure. A scenic character area may allow an overlook. And then the third characteristic you have to have as part of that legal document is me. And I'll stop there. But this is all in our ordinances right now. And you know, I guess the planning board needs to decide if what is being proposed is consistent with, one, the ordinances and consistent with the town's planning documents, specifically the current comp plan and the future open space preservation document. And just to kind of give some half to it, I brought the report, it's at least an inch thick. I'm happy to give a copy to anyone who wants it. It's also on the temp. Is that enough for now? Well, there's actually, more specifically though, is there anything in the ordinance that would restrict a, a landowner such uh, Maxwell Woods LLC from basically taking the two acres, giving them back to the original owner to use for agricultural space, 
and then using that amount in the open space calculation to get that 45%? I don't believe there is. And, and the applicant, I mean, I've been asked this question repeatedly. I think there are multiple ways to make this work. You could try to structure it as a PDR. I don't know why you would, since the agricultural open space and the proposed development are immediately adjacent to each other. Um, the applicant has submitted a revised application form today, which explicitly lists the Bamfords, who currently own the land that the agricultural easement would, is supposed to be located on, explicitly lists them as co-applicants for the project. So, I mean, from a, from not from a specific dotting the I's and crossing the T's from the ordinance perspective, but from a more global planning perspective, why wouldn't you want a farming family to own the land that an agricultural easement sits on top? And that's what I was looking for. That was the concern that I got a lot, or that we all got from the public. Certainly. Go ahead, Victoria. Yeah, to continue on that topic, um, I, I do want to make it clear so everyone did hear that the Bamfords, William and Lois, they are the co-applicants on this. That's why the 2.07 acres can be considered in this development, because they are the co-applicant. So I hope everyone kind of understands that. I don't know if somebody else can word it in a different it's way. pretty clear. But because they're all working together, they're co-applicants, that's why the, the land can be included. And then the Bamfords, uh, because it is going to be restricted for agriculture, they're going to be the ones, because as you notice, note number four said an applicant can be the person that is uh, making sure that the land is uh, being restricted. Uh, they're going to make sure that that is uh, used for agriculture. And as everyone's been quoting um, MSR's, M MRSA Title 36, farmland means any track or track of lands including woodland and wasteland. So when you look at those pictures and you say, it doesn't look like the Jordans, um, farmland has different meanings including woodland and wasteland. Uh, and so it I, and I'm not a farmer, so I'm not going to get into why farmland also means this. Um, must be a reason. It's what you're all quoting from, and it's right in there. So if it doesn't look like it's being farmed, maybe it's under the woodland and waste. I just wanted to add that in because I think that's what everyone is talking about, is that how can you include the land when the Bamfords still own it? Well, they're the whole applicant whatever it is. Thank you. I want to make sure that's really clear because that's where all the questions are. Okay. Any, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, not to, to spend too much time on this, but there, there may have been some thoughts that the um, Maxwell Woods LLC was just trying to take credit for land that had nothing to do with this project as part of its open space. And clearly it's not the case. And whether they're co-applicants as they are now, or there are several other different ways they could have conveyed the land and conveyed back the agricultural easements. The splitting the, the fee interest in the land and easements and rights to use the land is, is pretty common. And I, I certainly agree with some comments made about we should have a, a, a careful understanding of who owns what and is responsible for it, for sure. But there's absolutely no doubt that, that uh, those two plus acres are part of the land that is creating, the, the, from which this, this subdivision is coming. So I, I think that matter has, has been laid to rest quite well. Oh, and to another point, um, it's our, the advice that we have received is that the, all the crossing of the T's and the dotting of the I's and all the documents related that are coming from attorneys are part of the final process not part of the preliminary process. So we're, we're, we're not, this isn't gonna slide by, this is, this is going to be fully documented and uh, the attorneys are going to have a great time over the next few months putting it all together. Go ahead, Joe. Um, so would this 2.07 acres be legally part of the subdivision? You 
You're nodding your head yes. Yes, I'm nodding my head yes. <laughs> it, it, from the very beginning, every single plan that you have received has indicated it as part of the public. Go ahead, John. Um, one thing that I just wanted to say is appreciate the work that the applicant has done on that buffer between the cottage broken. The Maxwell was, I think it is a good improvement. Really took what the comment for I'm serious. Appreciate that. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> to, to add your phrase, it not only it serves as a nice buffer between the, the two components of the big subdivision, but it also it will be beautifying that trail passing between the two of them over which the people of the town will have a right to pass. So they're, I think the town is, is getting a, a nice benefit from that as well as the the buffering between the, the, the two developments. I'm going to ask the board something that I asked a couple months ago. Sometime, do you want to do another site walk without snowshoes? Um, so I don't know if it's anything we need to hurry and do in the next couple weeks, because it's obviously going to be a couple months before they're back here. But uh, in fact, the probably... earliest would probably be August before we're back, because the June meeting middle would be coming right up, and we won't be ready mid June for July. So it'll probably be August. Uh, maybe at our next workshop we can figure out and get yeah, some dates and we can propose some dates to you. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Victoria. Um, um, the questions. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, let, let's go back to landscaping. I'm not sure where your expert is. Highly. Um, but parking areas, they do need to be landscape and I was wondering I, I didn't see anything in regards to landscaping around the park if I can after the well I want her to want. once you yeah. plug it in have hmm? you plugged it in what? oh I don't know it's on my screen but you've been disconnected <laughs> who disconnected you I obviously did it this oh right here handicap So in our ordinance, it does say general site landscaping shall include transition areas from the building to the parking area and include a buffer between the developed portion of the site and the budding property. So around the parking, so in the backside. And i got to say, next time you return, I'm very curious to see what the backside of the multiplex looked like. We've seen revisions on the front. I, I haven't seen, I don't recall. We seen the back side yet. Uh, I think there was, was an elevation, there was, but there was, was an there elevation one time back or? at the preliminary oh, plan okay. that showed that. But I can, I, the final, I'll put it, I can put it in again. For that. But on the back side, we did. Um, was one of the comments that we had was to go from an uh, exterior to an interior stairwell, yes, part okay. of the building. So uh, yeah. we revised that. That was resubmitted. But yeah, we, just showed it. Uh, well, we can, we'll reprovide that. So I want to talk about landscape before Tyler gets up here. But so on the back side of the building here, mm -hmm. one of the things you have to remember is we brought units, we lifted the units up so they were more at grade with the street. All right. So that means I have to make up the grade someplace, which is in the back of the building. So it slopes off in the back towards the property. Now, one of the things we had to do in the back was there's a small swell that's off the back side and a rock wall back side of this parking lot that drains down into a collection area, four bays, then goes into an underground uh, stormwater tension and treatment system that then outlet over on this side. So I can't, if I plant trees or shrubs or anything in that, in that collection area, that 
well, that drainage area, that will impede the runoff. And it's a three to one slope, two to one slope in some areas off the back side to get down into the pond. So I run into some slope conditions that are a bit challenging. What we did do to the plan was, is, uh, of course, there's the landscaping around the front. Then we've added a couple of deciduous trees here in this landscape up at the lower side. And then there's a break in the wall where there's a little bit of a more gentler slope. And we added some coniferous trees right along the back side of that. So the idea, at least the thinking was, driving down the, the, the road here after lane or coming this way, you have these trees that are preserved here. You have street trees. You have the landscaping in front. You have these two trees. So when you look down the driveway, you don't have this corridor that goes straight down through. You have trees on, you have two trees on each side here. Then you've got some trees in the back. So it breaks up that view. Now this area here is another stormwater collection area uh, that I can't, if I can't, it's got filter media and filter beds in it. So it's really hard to plant in that. We do have over here a wetland area here that's all wooded and through here, which is on the town-owned open space. My trail system comes through here, and I've extended the slope out at a four-to-one slope, which is more appropriate for bike, pedestrian access in this area, right down to the wetlands. So I've, I've tried to manage that balance between gray, visual, apparent, stormwater management, street boulevard, and the landscaping, and quickly became a bit squeezed. I, I I just can't plant in those warm water feet because it, it it impacts those. Well I appreciate that explanation. How about the screening and buffering of and this is from our ordinance, above ground utility structures such as transformer boxes and pumping stations. How about the uh, screening and buffering of the thank you. That was on my list to talk about I didn't talk about that. So we have provided uh, our plans, the CMP, those paperwork going back and forth. They're doing the layout of where all the transfers are going to go. And we will buffer all of those transfers, just like we've done on the other projects. But once I know where there are, what we'll do is in the final submittal, there will be a um, specific detail that shows plant around each transformer telephone cable the screen. Uh, all right. A no pump know. station. But. Okay. Yeah, I read that. Correctly. Yeah. All right. Um, this was something that I brought up uh, your first time you were here that um, on, uh, I think it's sheet, um, get down. sheet two. You have your uh, diagram up in the uh, right hand corner of uh, the unit option detail diagram. And I noted back then that you had C note 20. Note 26. <laughs> As I say, note wrong. 20. I, I marked it up on my plan. I, it, I, I, it's been overlooked like three times. I'm sorry. <laughs> it All should right, be so note, like, note 20 does not make. Okay. No, note 26 is the correct note. Okay, thank you. And, um, okay, this is a little picky wordsmithing. So oh. just listen. On note 25. I am asking you where it says, uh, is allowed with permission of, Aris, can you find that wording, is allowed with permission of, uh, no, note okay. number 25, really? is allowed with permission of. Okay, yep. Yeah. Uh, your thoughts on if is allowed to be replaced with may be removed after consulting with. And it's a code enforcement officer. Instead of is allowed, maybe uh, may be removed after consulting with the. Uh, if that's okay with you, uh, I, I'm I'm good with that language. But it does. I get thumbs up for Maureen. Good. All right. Thank so you. that's going to read. Uh, I just want to make trees within the area designated as open space within the subdivision may be removed with permission. I thought the is allowed almost made it sound like it's allowed. Oh, I and see. So I yeah. maybe you're right. It you, almost could imply that. Yeah, you gotta get permission first, and yeah. then you're then yeah. it's allowed. 
Yeah, I just want to make sure that it's in that order. Um, I think that was it as far as things that I just wanted to see next time I was here, uh, next time you folks come here. Um, I also wanted to say um, thank you in regards to the affordable housing that you'll be putting in. Um, you're putting in two low income and two median. Thank you. That's the kind of housing that we do need. Um, and as people should know, in our ordinance, first dibs on this type of affordable housing goes to residents of Cape Elizabeth. So we reach out to our own and we are saying, if you don't make $86,000 a year, we have housing for you. If you can't find a resident of Cape Elizabeth that wishes to live in your development, then we reach out to the, uh, our workforce, people that work for the town, once again to say thank you for the work you're doing for our town. If you don't happen to make 86000 in your family, we have housing for you too. So, um, and I appreciate that you are, I think, going above. I think you're actually putting in more. I'm not sure if no, I got I, that right or is it exact? Two, I, th I thought there was two, 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 two low yeah. income. Yeah. Right, you could have done four moderate, so I'm, right. I'm saying thank you, because once again, our ordinance says we help our own, then we help our workers, which are teachers and, and so on, fire safety, so on. So I want to say thank you for doing that over and above. And those are the end of my... Any other comments, questions? Maureen? I, I just wanted to ask the planning board to... Owens, if you could focus in on that section of Pastor Lake where the trees, street trees are in between the road and the retaining wall. I just oh. want to make sure the board is aware of this situation. I know the applicant has raised it once. And the concern is that it may not be a very amenable location for street trees to grow. Right next to the road with a steep slope, a guardrail, and a retaining wall. On this side right here. So... On this side of the road, there is a retaining wall that runs yep. along the ro along the road. That retaining wall, the road's, geez, I want to say, eight feet above the grade level at the highest point in some areas coming through here. So there'd be a retaining wall. We are leaving space between the wall and the street. But we did ask uh, the board if they felt they weren't, um, the applicant is willing to plant those number of trees, but the question is, is, is that the right location for those number of trees? Should we um, relocate. relocate them someplace else? And now we're, we are going to add um, a bit of a grading easement just on this side of the wall for maintenance of the wall, but uh, the trees through here, you know, is there a better location for those trees? Um, you know, you know, we're, we're pretty proud, you know, there might be some opportunity to put some more trees with somewhere else in here. Uh, and maybe that is, can be decided at a workshop or at a, but we, we're just offering that we can't, they physically will fit in there, but we are just wondering if it made sense to put them someplace up. That's all. Is there an idea of something to replace them with, with to create a, I'm just asking, I'm not. In the back to come up with something and, okay. and put a proposal forward. We just, so I guess the first question is, is, is the board open to something alternative to that? Uh, if the board is, I will have Kyle look at what we might be able to do around that. And if there isn't, then we'll stay the original plan. <laughs> so we're just giving an option. I mean, they're not gonna grow, right? I mean. They'll grow, but, you know, uh, that area is a seven-foot wide area yeah. with a vertical, you know, or, and maybe the answer is, is instead of um, uh, the street trees in here, maybe it's some sort of a lower-growing tree or something that doesn't have the root. Uh, you should come up here with me because I'm going down the road that you know better than I do. But maybe there's an alternative around that. Um, if the lower shrubs are sometimes. Yeah. Again, we're not looking to get out of planting the trees along there. We're just saying. It doesn't bother trees. me if they're not there. I mean, if there's no other place to put them, we don't have them. It's certainly, uh, I'm trying to visualize it from the site walk. I know the area you're talking about, yeah. but that's 
an excellent topic for discussion at a site walk, but I, I know I'm open to discussing it and the option. Anybody opposed to negotiating something along that line? I think if it makes sense, it's just kind of tough to just visualize how it would be. I, well, I remember when we were, well, skiing, some of us were skiing along there. You were skiing. I was skiing. <laughs> but you said that the road is going to be way up here, so I, I know what you're talking about. And yeah. Planting trees there would be a waste of time and money, in my opinion. Go ahead, Mary. If I, I would be oh. happy to work with the applicant to find alternative locations. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, trees are always welcome. If it's acceptable to the board, one suggestion might be to increase the opposite side tree's caliper to a four-inch caliper so that you have a more robust tree that would displace the shade that you might have considered for the other ones. And then replace the, the the more planter bot side, we'll call it, with some low lying shrub. Yeah, I'm just thinking of buffering from the the Bamford's property on that. Right, right now you have a two and a half inch caliper spec. You could go with a four inch caliper, and that'd be a very hardy, beautiful tree. Okay, so we're it's, it's an open for discussion. Fair enough. We will put something together. Anything else? Does anyone want to uh, make a motion? Oh, go for it. Okay. Um, motion for the board to consider finding, findings of fact. Number one, Joel Fitzpatrick doing business as Maxwell Woods LLC is requesting major subdivision review and a resource protection permit to construct a 46 unit project consisting. 38 condominiums and eight apartments and two buildings located at 112 to 114 Spurwink Avenue. And amendments to the Cottage Brook subdivision to accommodate grading changes related to the construction of Astor Lane, which require require review for compliance with Section 16-2-4, Major Subdivision Review, Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit Regulations, and Section 16-2-5, amendments to the a previously approved of Number two, the subdivision will not result in undue water pollution. The subdivision is not located in a 100-year floodplain. Soils will support the proposed uses, the slope of the land, proximity to the streams in the state, and local water resources. Uh, resource rules and regulations will not be compromised by the project. Three, the subdivision will have a sufficient quantity and quality of uh, potable water. Four, the subdivision will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion control plan provided. Five, the subdivision will not cause unreasonable road congestion or unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic. Subdivision provides for road network connectivity while discouraging through traffic. Roads are laid out to conform to existing topography as much as is feasible. All lots are provided with vehicular access. Roads are designed to meet town standards. Six, the subdivision will provide for adequate sewage disposal. Seven, the subdivision will provide for adequate soil uh, solid waste disposal. Eight, the subdivision will not have an undue adverse impact on scenic or natural areas, historic sites, significant wildlife habitat, rare natural areas, or public access to the shoreline. Nine, the subdivision is compatible with applicable provisions of the comprehensive plan and town ordinance, and the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. Eleven, the subdivision will not adversely impact surface water quality. Twelve, the subdivision will not adversely impact the quality or quantity of groundwater. Thirteen, the subdivision is not located in a floodplain. Fourteen, the subdivision is in compliance with the town wetland regulations and the zoning ordinance. Fifteen, the proposed subdivision will provide for adequate stormwater management. Sixteen, the subdivision will not unreasonably increase the phosphorus concentration of Great Pond. Seventeen, the subdivision is not located in more than one municipality, 18, the subdivision is not located, not located on land where liquidation harvesting was conducted, 19, the subdivision does provide for access to direct sunlight, 20, the subdivision does provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the subdivision and screening as needed, 21, the subdivision will comply with the open space impact fee with the preservation of 8.47 acres of open space, 22, the, multiple, the multiplex units will be provided with access to utilities. 23, the subdivision plan will not be phased. 24, the proposed subdivision will not material obstruct the flow of surface or subsurface waters across or from the alteration area. 
25, the proposed subdivision will not impound surface waters or reduce the absorptive excuse me, capacity of the alteration areas so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent property. 26, the proposed subdivision will not increase the flow of surface waters across or the discharge of surface waters from the alteration area so as to threaten injury to the alteration area or to upstream and or downstream lands by flooding, draining, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. 27, the, sub the proposed subdivision will not result in significant damage to spawning grounds or habitat of aquatic life, birds, or other wildlife. 28, the proposed subdivision will not quote problem related to the support of structure. 29, the proposed subdivision will not be detrimental to aquifer recharge or the quantity or quality of groundwater. 30, the proposed subdivision will not disturb coastal dunes or contiguous uh, back dune areas. 31, the proposed subdivision will maintain or improve ecological and aesthetic values. 32, the proposed wetland alterations uh, are located in the wetland buffer. 33, the proposed subdivision will be accomplished in conformance with the erosion prevention provisions of environmental quality handbook, erosion and sediment, sediment control published by the Maine Soil and Water Conservation Commission dated March 1986 or subsequent revisions thereof. 34, the proposed subdivision will be accomplished with without discharging wastewater from buildings or from the, uh, or, excuse me, from other construction into the wastewater treatment facilities in violation of section 15-1-4 of the sewage ordinance. And 35, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1 and section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joel Fitzpatrick doing business as Maxwell Woods LLC for primary subdivision review and a resource protection permit to construct a 46 unit project consisting of 38 condominiums and eight apartments and two buildings located at 112 to 114 Spurman Avenue and amendments to the Cottage Brook subdivision to accommodate grading changes related to the construction of Astor Lane be approved subject to the following condition. That the plans be revised to address the recommendation of the town engineers that are dated May 15, 2017. Um, one question Did We add the co applicant to. That's not a bad idea. Doing business as Macaulay's LLC and Bill and Lois. Bill and Lois. So I'll just add that which And. To be a little picky, it's preliminary, not primary. Did I say primary? You did. I take that back. I preliminary. And also, I would just add um, to the findings of fact on number one, the uh, co applicant. Yes. Do I have a second? <laughs> Peter, second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. We'll be seeing you. We'll be in touch about a site walk. And it won't snow. All right. The next item on our agenda, 19 Wells Road Tower Overlay District Amendment. Okay. The Peoples of Town Council has referred to the planning board a request by Global Signal Acquisitions for LLC Crown Castle to um, establish a tower overlay district located at 19 Wells Road, section 19-10-3, amendments to the zoning map. And at this time, I will recuse myself as one of the owners of 19 Wells Road, and Joe will take over the chair.
All right, I'm just gonna repeat some of what Carol Ann said. The town council has referred the, to the planning board a request to establish a tower overlay district on the property located at 19 Wells Road. The request will be reviewed under section 19-10-3 amendments to the zoning map. Um, okay, so. You want to um, so for tonight, all you are going to do is schedule a public hearing for next month. Do you want me to summarize this? Yes. Okay. So what I'd like to do is So what you have is a request by Crown Castle, which has been referred to the planning board from the town council, create a new tower overlay district. Planning board had a workshop on this that you put it on tonight's meeting. The process would be to schedule a public hearing and then, then vote on advice that you would provide to the council. So the expectation is tonight you would table this next month's meeting when you would hold the public hearing. But I just wanted to make sure you had a, a, an up-to-date map of what is being proposed. So this map behind you is uh, the official zoning map for the town of Cape Elizabeth with the proposal by the applicant superimposed. So this pale yellow is the RA district. This uh, deep yellow is the RB district. I think we've written this as an RA to R to the tower overlay, but it's actually the BB district. And these numbers here are corresponding to surveyed information that the applicant has provided us because I had asked for more detailed information on exactly where this overlay district would be located. So I picked this point right here based on the applicant's information, went up about 457 feet, and then 410 by 447 by 410 by 447. So you've basically got a rectangle right here. And I just want to call the planning board's attention that if I have done this correctly, it appears that a portion of the overlay district is going to be in the RP1 wetland bucket. And the tower would probably be right in the location in the middle. So the tower would probably not be in the RP1 buffer. However, the access road to get to the tower is going to be in the RP1 buffer. There is an existing farm road that runs from Deer Run Road north and cuts across like this over to, to Cross Hill. And where there is an existing farm road under the resource protection regulations, you can rebuild a farm road. So wherever there is an existing road, access is still available. But if the applicant, is, as they're showing in their plans, want to peel off a new access road to the tower from this point right here, it's likely that they would have to build some new access road in the RP. And we just want to call attention to that because new road construction in an RP1 buffer is not a permitted use. We suspect that if you follow the farm road past the point where the RP1 buffer is located, that you could then build an access road into the tower from the west. And I'm just calling attention to this to the planning board. The only thing we know about is the access road. If there are any other support structures that need to support the tower that would be in the buffer, now is the time to make sure those structures would either be allowed or can be relocated. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah. So this is not, the wetlands have not been mapped yet on that. No, the, the map that has been provided by the applicant, I believe they have superimposed the wetland boundaries from the zoning map, which for the purposes of rezoning, you can do, but for the purposes of getting a permit for your activity, we would want field verification, something we talked about an hour and and there is actually, to be, to be clear, there's actually very good information on the location of that RP1 wetland. Uh, the Jordan Farm did come into the planning board for a subdivision off of Deer Run Road. And as part of that subdivision, they did do wetland mapping. So I think that there's really good um, field verified wetland. 
wetland mapping that is available. That mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, Victoria? Is this, um, I don't know the size of the RP1, as we discussed, depending on the size, is it 250 foot, 100 foot? I don't this, know. This RP1 is more than two acres. So it would be a 250 foot? Absolutely. Okay. I, I had a really hard time. I'm getting older. I can't read this. But is there a 250 buffer on, on any of these that are shown? Is there a buffer line shown? The, the buffer, actually, this map, right, we don't show um, RP1 buffers on the zoning map because it would be almost impossible. Yeah. But this particular wetland is significant enough. It's also triggering a shoreland zoning buffer. So this blue line here is the edge of the shoreland zone overlay district, okay. which is 250 feet wide. So this blue line, it, it's exactly the same place that the RP1 buffer would be. So we can use this as, as a substitute. 250 foot yes. buffer. Yeah. Jonathan? So it's fair to say that this um, map that, that we were provided by Crown Castle, or, well, that was made by Crown Castle, provided to us, will probably change with regard to the road if the layout is as you described. I'm assuming before the board makes the vote tonight, you're going to have a public comment for opening up. If there's representative Crown Castle here tonight, so maybe they can answer that question. I mean, the, the reality is that I think right now it looks like it might be possible to do this uh, as proposed and still make it work. Um, probably one of the questions the planning board may want to think about is, are you okay with recommending our overlay district that also includes an RP1 buffer? I don't think I need, that, need anybody to address the map right now. Anybody else? So I just want to make sure I know. What, um, so for next time, um, we are going to either find out if um, we would approve a tower overlay that would have a possible either a road or tower support structures in the overlay. I'm hoping, I'm looking at the applicant's representative, I'm hoping they may be forthcoming. Um, all I can tell you right now is this is my best sense of what they're proposing to overlay this. It includes an RP1. Okay, and new road construction is prohibited, so if they do, I can't find So that, that it plan is. they showed so us with the this, road coming from the south yeah. to the north, it looks very problematic. All right, and you're saying actually it should be coming? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that at some point, I think... I'm very comfortable that at some point that farm road leaves the RP1 buffer, and that at that point there would be an opportunity to build an access road outside the RP1 buffer. It would probably be from the west rather than from the south. Okay. I just want to understand what we'll be anticipating for next time. Because those are some questions. I have a question. I'm not sure how to ask to properly crazy question, but we've got another applicant that doesn't need a zoning change to put up a tower, but I know it's a separate issue, but are we wasting our time looking at this? Is the guy, the other guy doesn't need, and he just has to fill out a permit and put up a tower? No. You've been asked by the council to provide a recommendation on this specific request. Okay. You could decide that you don't think this overlay is, or you could decide that you're, you think this is a good idea, or you could decide that this is mostly a good idea, but it needs a little bit of a time. But you have some kind of yeah. Okay. So Maureen, just to uh, clarify, it's a two-step process, really, right? We approve the overlay district, and then they would submit a site plan. Right. What would happen is the planning board would provide a recommendation to the council, and then the council does the review of whether they think this is an appropriate zone change. They have to hold the public hearing first. Um, then they make a decision. If they say, yes, we, we want to create a new overlay district here, the applicant would still need to obtain site plan review from the planning board before a power review. And is this is the overlay district?
district tied to specific needs and bounds? Um, it should. It it should. Be. And if so, I mean, is it possible you could recommend and approve uh, overlay district, and then find that it does not work? Yes, which is why I have strongly encourage okay. the applicants to provide us with this information about where they want this overlay district to be located. It was my sense the information they provided us with was very good quality. It has, it's done by a spare, the, the distance is, it was tied to a specific point. Felt pretty comfortable. We can give this information to the surveyor and they can find it on the Maureen, there's nothing that's stopping the applicant from changing where they're proposing this uh, zoning. App or the, the, uh, yeah, thank you. The overlay district B on that map. I mean, it looks like they're kind of right on the border of that RP1 buffer. So. I, I do think that the applicant should look at this, and one of the options would be to revise where they think their overlay district Now, before we plan a uh, or schedule a public hearing, do we need that information, or can that just be part of? I would the want I would want that information a minimum of I I would want that information submitted by the submission deadline, which I believe is June second, and that would be plenty of time for my office to provide the appropriate legal notice of public hearing. Do I get a comment? Um, when we did have our workshop, um, it was noted um, that a one, one fourth mile or more creates a gap. Um, so when we're saying these are too close together, that comment was made. I don't have any documentation other than that comment was made to actually prove that the comment is correct, that if you move a fourth of one four miles or more, it creates a gap. And I was looking at what that actually means, and um, that's 240, it's actually 1,320 feet is 0.25, or um, in this application, the current location is just a 242-foot move. So if it was actually, and if that quote is correct, if it was actually moved 1,320 feet from the current overlay district that neighbors it, then it actually create the gap according to what we had heard in the workshop. So if this is all correct, that there is a gap, I would love to see any documentation that says yes, if that kind of a move, as small a movement as that, 1,300 feet, would create a gap. I would like to see that documentation. And um, if you're thinking about moving this, keep your um, comment about where the gap occurs in mind if you decide to move this overlay district. Those are just my comments on what we heard. And Joe, when we looked at this before, I was a little troubled by the fact that we seem to be in the middle between two competing tower uh, operators, and uh, which I thought was somewhat uncomfortable. On one side was making monopoly arguments, and the other side was making um, you know, their own arguments. But the particular piece of land they're talking about, Maureen, this is something which, this is, is this, this is not necessarily land they own, right? But they believe they have rights to, with a lease or whatever, to build a tower on the location. Correct. My understanding is that this property is owned by what I, what I call billboard, mm -hmm. four different property owners. And they have, Lease rights to. Okay, but at the moment, the the precise location is that fixed by the lease, or is this somewhat of a moving target? I, where I haven't seen lease that fixes the precise mm. location, but there may be. Um, but to meet some of your comments and Victoria's comments, would it make sense for them to um, ascertain where is the best spot for this tower? Not necessarily right where it is now because it, it does intersect the, uh, well, I the believe, wetland. I believe they have picked the best location for the tower by the Okay. So if they're, they're focused, it, it appears based on the and I looked at, they're really focused on elevation where they want the tower. I mean, you pick a high spot. 
sure. a little better. Uh, but the, you know, the size the, and particular configuration of the parcel as opposed to a, a square versus something that would follow contours, or uh, am I overthinking this? The square is, is rectangle. It's best for us for what purposes of the uh, We've done one of the off of our and again, it was a rectangle. Mm -hmm. It was a description provided by the, the people who wanted the tower. And we just want to create a district that a reasonable, talented surveyor or someone else can actually be reasonably can say we generally agree this is where it's located. So I'm not as concerned that the RP owner and the app agreed on a location because honestly neither one of them own their zoning is open. So if either one of those parties is unhappy now, we've asked them to tell us where is the area we want. Jonathan? One last question. But there's nothing that in the ordinance when it comes to these uh, these overlaid districts that makes it necessary to have it a rectangle or a square, correct? Correct. They could technically, if they weren't going to put the tower in the buffer area, they could just kind of configure it that it runs right along that buffer. They could. That's, that, you know, my my number one concern is that it's a description that is fairly simple and easy to interpret. But, you know, doing what you just said would be another way that would be pretty easy to interpret to find the upland edge of that one wetland you mentioned. for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted that uh, and the facts presented the request for a global sign uh, acquisitions for LLC Crown Castle to establish a town overlay district located at 19 Wells Road as depicted on the attached map be tabled to the regular June 20th 2017 meeting at which time a public hearing will be held do I have a second all in favor opposed it's unanimous Thank the chairman for his. Zoning amendment. The Cape Elizabeth Town Council has referred to the planning board a request by Brad Pearson to change the zoning for 27 Fowler Road from residence A to business B and to make text changes to the business B zoning district to permit landscaping contractor section 19 10 3 amendments. So tonight is to the zoning map, zoning ordinance and zoning map. So tonight is a public hearing on this item. No? Oh. Scheduling a public hearing. Oh, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> so, hey, the item on the agenda tonight is to schedule a public hearing for this. Um, are there any comments? Any questions? Any? Any? Do you want to hear anything from the public on this? A motion. Uh, you have a motion. Okay. <laughs> All right. Go motion. for it. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the map and material submitted and the facts presented, the request by Brad Pearson change the zoning for 27 Fowler Road, the U10 or U20-10 from residence A to, res uh, to business B, and to make text changes to the business B zoning district to permit the landscape contractor to table to the June 20, 2017 meeting, at which time a public hearing will be held. We have a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? I see unanimous. Uh, our last item is public comment. Comments on items not on the agenda. So if anybody has any, usually by this point the room is empty. So I, I'm pretty certain there's no one who has comments on something not on the agenda. Motion to 
to adjourn. Okay. All right. Motion. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? All those in favor? We're done. No, I thought we were having a public hearing.